glad that you're able to join us today for this, our first lunchtime talk regarding the watershed plan. Um, I'm going to close down video on myself because it helps with bandwidth and I encourage you guys to do likewise. And if everybody can turn off their mute, I'm going to delve into the PowerPoint. And the way this is going to go is uh, I'll deliver the PowerPoint presentation pretty much beginning to end. And so if you can make any notes of questions you have, we'll do Q&A all at the end. And we have other people from staff at MVCA here on the call with us that if there's anything I can't answer, um, I might pass to one of them. So I'm gonna uh, close out on the video and uh, open up the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, Dennis, I can see you. Can you wave at me if you can still hear me? And can you see my screen? Yay. Okay, I am good to go. Thank you, Dennis, for being my pal. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is introduce myself. My name is Sally McIntyre. I'm the general manager at Mississippi Valley. And uh, I've been in this position for the past two years, and I have the privilege of working with an incredibly talented team of professionals. Uh, there's uh, just under 30 of us in total who have responsibility over this watershed that is over 3,000 square kilometers in size. So um, it's, a, it's a big responsibility. Allison Simon is the project manager at our office. She's the watershed planner who's been spearheading this whole watershed planning initiative. And uh, all the good work that you're going to be seeing, she has been, you know, front and center in developing it, and uh, uh, is a terrific resource uh, to the authority and as well to you. And she's the person who, if you have follow-up questions, you can contact, and we'll be providing you that information at the end of the presentation. I just also want to introduce. Uh, a couple of other people who are on the call with us here today. Shana Gatoski is our uh, communications coordinator and she is managing this uh, event. And so if at any point I have problems, you will hear me speaking to Shannon. <laughs> she will also be moderating questions at the end of the, the, this presentation. Um, and uh, before we get into that, I'll, I'll explain to you how that will work. Also on the line, we have two of our uh, experts from our water resources group. We have Jen North, who is our watershed technologist, who is the person who is responsible on a day in day out work basis, working with our field crews to uh, operate our water control structures uh, to manage flows uh, and levels on the watershed. As well, we have Chris McGuire, who is uh, an engineer with our group who works closely with Jen and uh, as well on our whole monitoring network and on the flood forecasting and warning system, the two of them together cooperate on that. As well, Chris has responsibilities for reviewing of applications uh, for planning and permits in the watershed and assessing them to make sure that what's being proposed is safe for people and property. So that's a, a quick uh, update on who's on the phone here from MVCA. So now I just want to do a quick poll of all of you to see who all we have on the call today. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison, who's going to do this quick poll. Hi, everyone. Um, just I just thought I should say a few things about the polls before I actually launch the first one. Um, the questions are set up so that they allow for more than one response. So for example, if you're here today, both as an interested resident, um, as well as because it's relevant to your work, you can select both of those answers. And each of the questions is set up for multiple answers. Um, so I've launched the poll. Hopefully you're all seeing it on your screen. There are three questions in this first one. So if you could answer those three questions and I'll wait till it looks like everyone has responded and then I will close and share the poll results. 
And I should also add that we don't see who's responding. So this is all confidential. Uh, quick question to Shannon, are we recording this? We are. Okay, so I, I needed to say that disclaimer at the beginning. Because not everybody who wanted to participate today was able to join us, we are recording this uh, and we will be posting it to our website so that those who weren't able to join us will be able to hear the presentation and, and listen to some of the Q&A at the end. Allison, the submit doesn't seem to work. Uh, you may have to scroll down. You'll see that gray bar at the right side of the poll. Scroll down to make sure that you didn't miss the, the third question. Okay, thanks. So, so far we have 18 responses. Uh, Shannon, do you know how many we have on this meeting without staff? Uh, yeah, without Not staff, we staff. have 25. Okay, so we're up to 20 responses. I'll, I'll wait another few seconds and... Okay, it looks like that might be it. So we've got 20 responses. I'll end the poll and share it. So hopefully you're all seeing the results on your screens. So uh, you may only see the responses to two questions, depending on how it's displaying. If you want to see all the results, you either have to scroll down or expand the little box that's in the upper right. So what we can see here is most of you are here today because you have property and live in, in the watershed, which is fabulous. Uh, and 15% of you actually uh, have work related to this. Um, and what I love to see is a tremendous distribution amongst the municipalities. It's great to see that we've got a cross section of folks uh, participating from across the watershed. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. So thank you very much for participating in that poll. And uh, uh, to get rid of the poll on your screen, just click the little black X. Okay, so moving on uh, with the agenda, I just want to say that um, the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna start by sharing some key facts about the watershed and then expanding on some of the challenges and opportunities we've identified to date and get a bit of feedback from you on what your perception is. Uh, and then um, we'll walk through a selection of the actions. There, there's 35 actions in total Many of them apply across many different themes. And we're, we're just taking a subset that are relevant to this particular uh, theme of, um, of water resource management and we'll present them and then we'll get into the Q&A. So I, I'm looking at the clock and we're already at 12, uh, almost 12.30. So I'm gonna get right to it. If I can get my screen to go forward, hold on a sec. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so a, a quick bit of background why we're working on a watershed plan. Uh, there's a lot of pressures that we're facing um, as water managers and as communities in the watershed, uh, not least of which is the impacts of climate change. We are already seeing those um, on, in our monitoring stations and in how we're having to manage the the, the river system. Um, and these uh, are evidenced by, you know, six large floods in the past 21 years and two in the past uh, four years. We've also had four droughts in the past seven years. Uh, a lot of our infrastructure is quite old. Um, some of these things were built uh, 100 years ago and, uh, and are def definitely in need of replacement. And we got to figure out what we want to do with them. Um, we've also seen uh, potential harmful algae blooms occurring in, in certain areas of the watershed. Of course, there's the ongoing pressure of growth across the watershed and particularly in the east. And then again, as a result of climate change, we've seen um, invasive species on the rise and that's affecting our forest cover and, and other areas of interest in the watershed. 
So these are things that collectively we're having to address. Now, the watershed process is being done uh, in consultation with a public advisory committee that we set up actually in the fall of 2019. And so this is a group of people that uh, represent a cross section of residents and interests across the watershed, everything from the forest sector to recreational sector to lake associations and uh, as well as power producers. And, and they've been very helpful with us in doing the background work and producing some background papers that you might have seen on our website. And most recently in identifying issues and opportunities and, and capturing them in the discussion papers that we just most recently published. And so now between now and summer, our goal is to engage with the community in these matters and to get feedback from you on what you see as the priorities and what we as MPCA should be working on, what you think your municipality should be working on and what we could be collaborating on uh, with each other or other organizations. So we have been engaging with and continue to engage with a huge cross section of, uh, of groups. And, and this slide just gives you a sense of all the people that we've been speaking to and or will be speaking to in the coming weeks. So when I spoke about the themes earlier, these are the key broad uh, uh, goals or theme, thematic goals that we're looking at uh, that you can see. So when I speak about the 35 actions, they fit under one or more of these themes uh, that we have goals, specific goals and objectives for. So you can see it relates everything from how we manage the system through to how we manage growth and development, through to education, outreach, and stewardship. Uh, and, and because the system, as I mentioned, is 3,000 square kilometers plus in size, and as seen by the poll, all of you, no matter what municipality you come from, have an interest in how this watershed is managed. Um, all of these things uh, are of interest to you in some shape or form either directly or indirectly. So here we have a, a, a map of the watershed. So you see uh, where the water flows from all the way from the uh, um, Addington Highlands at the very lower um, left of your, your screen there and, and around Charbot Lake area, uh, out to where it outlets in the Ottawa River near Galetta in the city of Ottawa. Uh, what you're seeing there uh, highlighted in, in red are all the different um, uh, control structures, some of which are owned by us and some by others like MNRF and OPG. Um, and as well, you're seeing our five reservoir lakes. So we have Shabamika Lake Dam, Masna Lake Dam, or well, the dams control the reservoirs, um, Kashwakamak, Big Gull, and Malcolm Lake. Those are our reservoir lakes in the watershed. So getting to some of the key facts, MVCA owns 11 and, uh, dams, but we also operate several other ones on behalf of MNRF. And then uh, six more structures are owned by power producers. I've already mentioned the reservoir lakes and I forgot the biggest one, crotch. How could I forget that? I'm sure Jen and Chris are rolling their eyes at me. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> the important thing about crotch lake is it not only is our biggest one, it has as much capacity as all the other ones combined. That just speaks to the size of it relative to the others. Um, water in the, the watershed is managed in accordance with a water management plan. Now this is a regulated document we're required to have with the power producers and it tells us the operating limits that we're supposed to strive to achieve at each of our dam structures. And it applies not just to us, but to MNRF and to the power producers. Now it really pertains mainly to the larger dams, but the goals and objectives it speaks to into the, in the management plan speak to the same sort of objectives we have at the watershed level, for instance, around you know, natural systems and the like. But the main thing to understand from this is that the water management plan tells water control operators uh, how they're to operate the system. So yes, we have a certain amount of leeway in how we operate them to respond to what we're seeing based upon the data we're collecting and the modeling 
uh, and predictions we're, we're generating, but ultimately we're doing so within the direction set by this water management plan that's approved by the province. The difference between a water management plan and a watershed plan is a watershed plan looks at soup to nuts it, uh, and it, it's, um, it's more of an inter-jurisdictional document as opposed to a regulatory document. It's a planning and policy document that allows us to have the very conversations we're having here today about what are our priorities for the watershed? Um, what are some of the actions we want to take collectively or individually? Uh, whereas the water management plan is truly an operational document geared and targeted towards those who are controlling the dam structures. So I think I've touched on these. Uh, other than um, the last one I just wanted to speak to is that Dalhousie Lake and Mississippi Lake were developed prior to regulations being in place. And that's why um, you have so many uh, dwellings and, and structures that are built within the flood plain and are subject to uh, regular intermittent flooding. Um, particularly as they are also generally flatlands. And so when the water comes down the river system and it hits those lakes, it spreads out wide into that plain. And then as well, because at the outlets at the downstream side of those lakes, there's a constraint, the river closes up again and there's actually underground, underwater changes in elevation that constrain the water from exiting the lake. So you have a whole bunch of water entering those lakes, spreading out into the plain and then staying there because it can't get out as quickly as it's entering. So some of the cha challenges and opportunities, the overriding one that you'll see sprinkled throughout the, the next few slides is climate change. We are seeing statistically more frequent and extreme rainfall and flooding events. We're seeing an earlier spring freshet. We're seeing prolonged periods of low slumber, summer flow and more frequent drought-like conditions. These are actually happening and measured in our watershed. So what we're experiencing globally, we are absolutely experiencing in our watershed. And that is having impacts on the natural landscape um, and has the potential to continue to going forward. Now, as I mentioned earlier regarding the, the uh, Mississippi River Water Management Plan, it sets targets for how we're to operate the system. But in climate change, in this uh, uh, time of cha changing climatic conditions, this is going to become increasingly difficult for us to achieve. The other thing to recognize is that when that plan was developed, it did not have, um, uh, we did not have a model uh, or the capacity to do uh, analysis of what impact climate change would have on flows. And so one of the things we are recommending going forward is that we open up that water management plan, do the kind of analysis that will allow us to model uh, what the impacts of climate change will be, and therefore to be able to quantify and share with you as residents and, and landowners and, and people within the watershed, what the risks are and what the potential um, solutions are or how we can manage those risks. So along this line, of course, is um, drought and low water response. So we do have legislative responsibility to manage a low water response team and to help coordinate action uh, and to advocate for water conservation. But you can see where on a go forward basis, if under periods of prolonged drought, there's going to be pressures on us as the operator to provide everybody up and down the system with the water they want. And just to give you a sense of the conflicting priorities that we will experience when these events occur, if you think about the community of Carleton Place, they have a water intake that services the town that set at a certain elevation in the river and requires a certain amount of flow and clarity of flow to uh, serve that entire population. Similarly, downstream at Carleton Place and further downstream in Almont, 
they have wastewater discharges going to the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River in that context is considered a receiving water body. And the certificates of approval from the province for those treatment plants assumes a certain amount of flow in the river to protect the river system and the natural ecology from the impacts of a treated wastewater. Now, by the same token, there's all, everybody upstream at the end of their dock will want water. <laughs> everybody will want water at the end of their dock. And so the challenge going forward, you can see, will be how to maintain and meet those kind of requirements that uh, people will ask for to maintain water levels throughout the water system while also ensuring sufficient flow downstream to meet the needs of those two particular communities. So that's just an example of the complexity that we're going to have to deal with on a go forward basis. So related to this then it's water storage. As mentioned earlier, we have those six reservoir lakes, uh, but in the scheme of things, we don't actually have a whole lot of reservoir capacity. Just by way of comparison, the one reservoir on the Madawaska system, and I can't remember the name of it, I wanna say Bear, but anyway, has more capacity in that one reservoir than all of our reservoirs combined. Uh, and again, if you think of the watershed as being 3000 square kilometers, these relatively small lakes and the, the freeboard, the amount you know, that we draw down to and then fill up to is not a whole lot of storage capacity. So what we need to grapple with is uh, how are we gonna manage the capacity we have and can we find additional capacity in the watershed to help us address the changing needs for water management going forward. So related to this, we also need to acknowledge that we actually have in the form of um, wetlands, a lot of storage capacity. And these wetlands provide tremendous uh, flood mitigation uh, when we have severe wet weather events. And they also ameliorate the impacts of drought. And so another key opportunity we see is to accord actual financial values to those wetlands so that people understand the um, value of those, uh, what we call ecological services to us um, by the storage and slow release they provide of water in the watershed. So lastly, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, dams that are ending uh, at coming to the end of their lifespan. Some of you may have seen our most recent ad in papers regarding um, uh, work we're doing on the KMP, uh, which is a trail that we have going through um, the west end of the um, watershed. We also are, are working um, and to replace the Shabamika Lake Dam this, uh, uh, this year. And the Shabamika Lake Dam has a, a price tag of roughly $1.5 million. So to replace a dam is, is costly. And if we're gonna replace it, we wanna make sure we're replacing it uh, with an appropriate technology and that we're considering how we can optimize the use of that dam on a go forward basis. So to that end, we really need to uh, have the tools to enable us to um, examine on a, a watershed basis, the opportunities both for storage and how we can operate those dams and, and replace those dams over time to, to get the best value out of taxpayers' money. So along that line, um, we have begun work on an asset management plan, but that, this is something that we're gonna be continuing to work on uh, for years to come. So I'm gonna stop talking at this time. It's been a lot of information. You've all been very patient. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Allison to conduct the next poll. Okay, so this poll is just one question and we're asking you to provide two responses. So it's your two top choices. And hopefully you can all see the poll on your screen.
So we're at 19 responses. I'll give it another, oh, we're up to 21. I'll give it another few seconds and then I'll end the poll and share the results. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And hopefully you'll see the results on your screen. Wow, this is uh, really interesting. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on this. So I'm just going to speak to the aging infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we have begun work on an asset management plan. And in fact, um, just in December, we took forward to our board a 10 year capital plan and the board has committed to expending uh, in the order of $5 million over the next 10 years to work on improving our dam structures. So I want you to know that our board is also <laughs> of this mind that we need to really work on ensuring the integrity of our, our infrastructure. And, and we will be doing a, a lot of work in this regard over the next 10 years. So thank you everybody for sharing that. And if you just wanna click that little X in your upper right corner, we'll, we'll carry on with the PowerPoint. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into a selection of the, the draft actions and I emphasize the word draft. Um, uh, just a bit of background on this, working with the, the uh, public advisory committee, we initially had a list of over 140 actions. Um, but you can imagine they went from soup to nuts and they also went from, you know, very, very specific detailed to very broad type. And so we worked very hard over um, a period of weeks with the public advisory committee to get it down to a reasonable number of actionable things that we felt that we could move forward with. And, and so the total list of 35 actions is available on our website. And what I'm presenting to you here is just a subset that are specific to water management. There are other actions that we identified with respect to water management. And again, you can see those on the website in, in the discussion paper. Okay, so uh, starting with actions five and six, and these relate to you know, the full 35. So actions five and six relate to us developing a watershed model and updating the water budget so that we have a really good handle on the water needs and how to address the impacts of climate change um, and to really inform our day-to-day -day and seasonal operations of the watershed and our dam structures. Action seven is to update the water management plan. So I spoke to that already. We really need to sit down with the other operators on the system, the hydro producers and MNRF and, and look at whether or not we need to adjust the operating parameters and potentially introduce new conditions associated with the kind of extremes of conditions that we're contemplating under climate change to figure out how collectively we will need to manage flows and levels in the watershed going forward under those kinds of scenarios. So we really think that that's an important piece of work that we'll need to do going forward. As already mentioned, to continue to develop and implement the asset management plan for our water control structures. And this is going to be, you know, probably a, a 20 to 25 year plan for us to address all the condition issues that are with our uh, uh, dams. But I do want to assure you, however, that we have been prioritizing and working on those that, you know, of greatest need first. And, uh, um, uh, our hope is that with funding from the province, we'll be able to carry out those works in a timely manner. So we are currently right now working on an application to the province for 50% funding to replace that Shavamika Lake Dam. So when I spoke to you earlier about the estimated cost being $1.5 million, it is contingent on us getting 50% of that funding from the province under a program it runs with conservation authorities. So uh, we are very hopeful that we get funding from the province this year to carry out that work. And lastly, uh, we want to look at, is there an opportunity to improve or optimize storage capacity in the system for us to create more uh, storage capacity and or to operate the system in a manner that allows us to use it more effectively and or to be able to quantify for people and have them understand 
the role that wetlands play and therefore to protect them on a go forward basis so that we don't lose that natural storage capacity in the system. Uh, action 12 is to, to work with the municipalities on that very last item that I spoke to because it, at the end of the day, um, municipalities uh, have responsibility for land use approvals. Uh, we have some permitting uh, authority, um, but the municipalities, you know, are, are the lead game, as it were, in terms of regulating land development. And so it's really important that we work closely with municipalities and the landowners of those wetlands to make sure it's understood uh, the value of them and that they're protected in a fair and equitable manner. So lastly, uh, and I spoke to this earlier, is we need to collectively figure out our approach to managing low waters. Uh, that if, if we have prolonged drought in this watershed, there are several conflicting interests in the watershed and we need to figure out um, how we're gonna operate it on a priority basis to make sure that um, priority needs are met. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Alison to ask her to administer the next poll. Okay, so this um, final poll is again one where you can you're we're asking you to select two responses. So we're up to 18. I'll give it a few more seconds to see if we get more. Um, someone's just mentioned that they're not seeing the call. Um, oh, they may need to go down to the bottom of their screen. Uh, and I, I don't have it in front of me. Let me just see if I can. There is a, uh, no, I can't while I'm in uh, showing my, uh, do you see down by the chat, there may be a more code or something like that where you can identify the poll. I'm not quite sure how to how to address that problem. I think we'll just have to uh, maybe if the, if you're if you have comments, we we do have um, questions and answers next. So if you want to express your priorities, then that's another opportunity. So I think I'm going to shut the poll and share results. Yeah, these are really interesting results um, and a, a real mix. So, I mean, again, this is exactly what demonstrates um, the variety of, of priorities and issues up and down uh, the watershed and, and why we need to ha be having exactly these conversations. So thank you so much for participating in the poll. And if you just wanna click the X in the upper right, um, I'll just carry on here. Okay, so uh, the way this next section is going to work, and, and actually I think, um, do I have a slide after this? I, I do, okay, so, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop my share at this point, actually. Um, and at the bottom of your, uh, your screen, you're going to see a, a code that says participants and I see participants with the number 31 on it. If you click on that, 
uh, the list of everybody who's participating today will show. And you'll, you should see your name at the top. And, and you should see in the little codes beneath a hand, a, a blue hand. If you want to ask a question, just click on that. And Shannon's going to act as our moderator and she'll uh, identify you and, and give you the go ahead and unmute you so that you can uh, ask the, the question. Okay, so I see already some hands going up. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Shannon to moderate the questions. Sure. Okay. So we will, uh, we have some questions um, in the chat, but I see that those um, questions, uh, those folks have their hands raised. So I'm just going to go in the order that, um, that they're raised right now. So we'll start with Frank Mills. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Uh, my main concern is uh, water levels on Lake Mississippi during the spring freshet and the impact that they, uh, the Main Street Dam in Carlton Place has on this. Uh, essentially, it can raise the level by a meter, and it did so in the uh, 2019 freshet, where we had almost uh, record lake levels. I want to know if that's going to be included in your planning activities. As you know, the, the bridge is being rebuilt this year in the next couple of years and there is an opportunity probably to deepen the channel under the bridge. So thank you for that um, uh, Frank. So we have had those conversations with uh, the town and they are aware of that opportunity. We don't have uh, authority over um, that uh, replacement of that bridge and so to the extent that the town is aware and, and can take that decision, I'm not sure uh, financially uh, where they stand on that and whether there's an opportunity for uh, benefiting parties like yourself elsewhere in the, on the lake and those townships to work with the town to work towards that. I, I don't believe that it's part of their plan right now, but um, we're not part of that approval process at this time. Uh, Sally, I guess uh, support is what we're looking for. That's what I'm looking for. If NBC supports this kind of activity, then that at least uh, gets one stakeholder identified on the table. Yeah, thanks, uh, Frank. And I believe we are on record as identifying that as an opportunity to address flooding on Mississippi Lake at this time. Uh, but beyond identifying it as an opportunity. We're not in a position to, to mandate that of the town. All right, next we have George. You're on mute. There we go. Yes. All right, I'm, I'm uh, representing the Lake Mississauga Association, which is upriver. Um, we have a small dam at the end of our lake. And I, I guess, according to the discussion, it's not uh, considered a, a reservoir lake. Is that That's correct? correct? That's correct. Okay, because it only, it, it, not more than a meter control on the lake, I know, in, in the spring. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, That's all I had to ask for now. I'm going to have to leave early, so see me cut out. Okay, uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks. And next we have Dennis. And Dennis, you're on mute. Is that, there we go. You get it? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having the opportunity to, uh, uh, to participate here. I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm way down below the basin, right below the Galeta Dam, not too far from there. So I get the water from all the way up and I also get the water from the Ottawa River. So my, my question that having canoed and kayaked up and down the Mississippi almost everywhere uh, is the water control. I, I realize the municipalities, they run the sewage systems and so on and so forth. But I, I, I'm worried of, of whatever else goes through that water, including water from the streets, uh, salt and the phosphates and, and the fertilizers and all that. And, 
Okay, well, well, what I'm wondering is what's your role in, I'm not saying overshadowing the responsibilities of municipalities, but how, how do you link with municipalities to make sure that the water that I swim in here, down here, is as, as clean as possible, keeping in mind the length of this corridor of, of, of this watershed? So, um, Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority and other CAs are, are provided an opportunity to comment on planning applications. Our permitting responsibilities don't pertain to quality per se, uh, except for potential impacts on wetlands, but um, really we're, we're looking at the impacts of development on water flows and levels. Now that said, uh, we have memoranda of understanding with both the city of Ottawa and the county of Lanark to provide support to municipalities when they're commenting on planning applications to um, address matters that municipalities are obligated to consider under provincial law. Okay. And so we will comment on things like impact to natural systems and that can include commenting on potential pollution. The important distinction you need to understand though is that when we're acting as a regulator in, in uh, permits, we actually have decision-making authority. When we're providing advice to municipalities as it pertains to provincial law, um, that's all we're doing is <laughs> we're providing advice. Uh, so we don't have a regulatory role in that kind of um, area to the same degree that we do under our permitting authority. Now that said, of course, we generally uh, have um, do education and outreach around pollution mitigation, but um, not to the same degree as either the municipalities or quite frankly, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Okay, so just a quick sub question. Who, who would I address myself to in order to understand uh, or to get information on the water quality all along the Mississippi, Mississippi Valley uh, Basin? Who, who would give me that information? Well, interestingly enough, we can, <laughs> because uh, the province has a, a memorandum of understanding with conservation authorities to collect water quality data on its behalf. And so we do have water quality data. And uh, if you just want to email Allison, she can put you in contact and help you find that information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we don't have any more hands at the moment, but we did have a question on the chat from Louis. Um, he asks, uh, why do you limit the cause of invasives to climate change? Sorry, repeat the question. Yeah, he asks, why do you limit the cause of invasives to climate change? Oh, if I gave that impression, that wasn't my intent. Um, it's a, a contributing factor. There's any number of causes to invasive species, not the least of which uh, is the importation from foreign lands. Uh, so, so if I gave you that impression, my mistake. All right, and next up we have Greg Ellis. And yeah, Hi. you're off. Hi, I'm with the uh, Silver Lake Association and I'm just wondering if the uh, revised management, water management plan will uh, acknowledge that beaver dams provide a lot of reservoir storage, but also should be managed, even though nobody seems to want to. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm uncomfortable making that specific commitment at this time because uh, I really don't know in, um, uh, enough about that subject to, to be able to speak knowledgeably on how much that kind of feature is factored into the overall modeling. Maybe at this point, I might inv invite um, Chris or Jen to speak to that issue. Chris, are you on the line still? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, I think from my experience with the plan, it's got it's it's more based on our our dams and the operating targets for each structure. Um, so for Silver Lake, it's difficult because we don't have a control in the outlet of the structure to um, to have targets for the lake. It'd be difficult to 
to achieve. Um, but, uh, you know, that being said, it's, it's, you know, can we include it a little more? Can we specifically reference it? Maybe there'd be an opportunity. Um, and just big thanks to Greg for your help with, uh, uh, we've been looking at benchmarks around the area up there and uh, I really appreciate all the help you've given me to, uh, to try to find the sites and hopefully we can touch base in the spring. So thanks for calling in today. You're welcome, Chris. Um, and thanks for being uh, so cooperative with that stuff. But uh, our, our particular situation here is the lake level has, the beavers management has brought it up to uh, its near flood status now. And, uh, you know, if they stop, maybe we'll be all right. If they don't stop, we'll have some issues. But uh, part of my question was, you know, I, I don't think the amount of water that's held back by beaver dams is included in the storage capacity for the system that sounds like the reservoir capacity could be higher. And if that amount of uh, volume of water was included, it might uh, make things a little easier, but it's difficult to manage, that's all. No, excellent point. And uh, I'll, I'll just make the additional comment that um, uh, similarly, but of a different vein, um, municipal drains, um, the impact that they have in, in terms of flows. Uh, and we had a question, um, I was at council at Mississippi Mills a, a couple of months back and they said, you know, we have a, a program potentially to uh, improve a, a huge, you know, hundreds of kilometers of municipal drains could that have an impact? And the short answer is absolutely, it could have an impact. So this is an example of where our infrastructure and municipal infrastructure and beaver dams, they, they all intersect because they all have some shape or form of controlling the rate of flow hitting the river system. And Dennis, do you have your hand up again? Um, just a, another quick question there. Um, having gone through uh, uh, two major floods down here, uh, of which we were lucky enough that our property was high enough that it was not, not affected. The question is that uh, since we're at the intersection of the Mississippi and you know, the Ottawa, how do you guys manage this? Because you know a lot of people here are saying, well, it was the fault of the Ottawa system. They were not managing it and they let too much water out at Portage. And then other people say, well, they let too, too much water out of the Mississippi. So when that happens, who, who runs the show? How, I just want to understand, how does it go? Who's, who's running the show here? Because the more water that comes down the Mississippi, the more into and the Madawaska, the more in the Ottawa and so on and so forth. So that must be one hell of a mess to try to, 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 management, to manage that. So who, who, who's in charge when two basins are, are hitting each other at, when the flood occurs? Okay, I'll, I'll start the answer and then I might uh, pitch this over to Jen uh, to, to elaborate. So first, a couple of comments. Uh, one thing to recognize is that the Mississippi is one of many tributaries to the Ottawa River, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and there are other CAs downstream of us who manage flows on the, the, um, the Rideau Valley and, and the South Nation, et cetera. And similar on the on the Quebec side and then all the way upstream as well. Now, um, after the flood of 2019, the province of Ontario hired a fella out of Manitoba to do an independent review. And he did find that the water operators on the Ottawa, as well as those of us, you know, at the more local level on, on tributaries did the best we could, that that was an extreme event and that simply put, our systems were overwhelmed by the volume of water that came at us. Um, and, and I guess the, the point I always make is that water flows downhill and, and we have no control over how much mother nature flows, uh, throws at us. We hold it back to the degree that we can safely and then we must let it pass because it wants to and it will. And so we need to do so in a controlled manner to mitigate any further damage happening at or around our dams. As it was in 2019, we had a blowout of our bypass of the Masnot Lake Dam. So that just speaks to you know, the sheer volume of water coming at us from the very top of the watershed. And that was happening throughout the watershed. Mm -hmm. 
as it pertains to the interjurisdictional nature of water management, and in particular on the Ottawa River. I'm now going to pass it over to Jen. Jen, are you still on the call? Um, I, I'm not sure if, I think Jen was having some connection issues, but I, I could answer that if you want, Sally. Okay, go for it. Um, so yeah, great question, Dennis. Um, the big thing to, to realize with the Ottawa and the Mississippi coming together is that say, if we look at a 2019 peak flow, we've got 5,000, 5,500 CMS coming down the Ottawa River, and we've got uh, 250 to 300 CMS coming out of the Mississippi. So just because of the order of magnitude of the two systems, the Mississippi's got a very, very minor, um, almost unnoticeable impact on, on the kind of flooding that you're seeing where the two come together. Um, and the other thing that's, uh, that's a real challenge for the Ottawa River Planning Board is that um, the upper watershed, that 40% is controlled, but the 60% of the lower watershed is uncontrolled. So once those reservoirs have filled up, there's nowhere for the water to go. So for people on the call in the Mississippi system, it's the same as when Crotch Lake is full. That's when we start to have our Dalhousie, Mississippi issues. Um, so, uh, but there's there's some great resources too uh, on their website that it'd be worth checking out the planning board website for more information on that. Okay. Um, and a good example of just how different the two watersheds can be, like uh, the Ottawa River is an enormous watershed. They've got more than average snow right now up in the north. Whereas in the Mississippi, we've got uh, less than average snow pack for, for this time of year. So it, uh, it just goes to show how we can have with two different rivers, very, very different, uh, very different conditions and, and uh, spring freshets. So does that kind of help, help understand yeah. it? I thank you for that. All right, and that's it as far as questions. Okay, well, that's fabulous. I'm just gonna call up my last, uh, slide then so that people can take down contact information. Um, can everybody see my new slide? Get a thumbs up from people? Hmm. No, it's the Q&A slide. Q&A. Okay, all right, there we go. So um, we're in the process of, you know, we've just released these discussion papers. We're looking for you to review them and give us feedback. You can find all of them on our website. The site is located there. We're looking for you to provide us feedback by March 19. And if you have questions or comments, or if you want additional information that some of you are looking for some water quality information, contact Allison and she can point you in the right direction. And, uh, and we really look forward to hearing back from you because this is going to be a conversation we're going to be having for weeks and months and years to come. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating today. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon and a lovely long weekend. Take care, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.